Thank you all for coming. I'm happy to see you. that many places. And it's a pleasure for me, I'm also very proud that I can uh, introduce the three lectures of the day of the inaugural sessions. But before introducing the people, maybe a very short introduction to the department for those people who don't know us. So, the Department of Biosystems, our main aim is engineering life. What does it mean? That we want to develop knowledge, methodology, tools to design, optimize, and manage biological processes uh, and products and these with applications both in the agri food as well as human health. And then we also, besides research, research provides education and services in these areas. So as you can see, it's kind of an interplay. We are on the interplay between technology and biological systems. In order to do this, how we organize, we have three divisions, research divisions, probiotics, animal and human health engineering, and mechatronics, biostatistics, and sensors. And the good news today is that the three lecturers are each from a different division, so we are nicely covering the three divisions of the department. The first speaker will be Professor Deva Meta. I will not go through the detail what he will talk about, but the title of this is Engineering Plant Biology and Imagining Research Culture as an Early Career Scientist. Then we will have the next speaker, who is Professor Carmen Wang. He will talk about human health, safety and body need, interactions with near body, built and atmospheric environments. And lastly, we have Professor Jan Arts, who will talk about from complexity to comprehensibility and thinking with the view on biological and agricultural systems. For each of them, we foresee about 30 minutes. If there would be questions, there are very good room for questions, please uh, keep them. After the presentation, so we don't ask questions during the presentation. <coughs> and after this one hour and a half, the group uses, we also have a reception. The reception, there will be people, the friendly people of the secretariat, they will guide you if necessary in the cases, maybe what even 100 meters from here. It's in the point of computer sciences, there will be uh, where we can have a drink. And then my last slide. Uh, some upcoming events in the department. We have uh, the beginning of the month in December the emergency celebration of Herman the Month. We will also have our department to complete the 9th of January, the same day, but in the evening. We will have our, our evening late afternoon, we will have our new evening, and then 29th of May, we also have our department conference. Okay, having said this, it's my pleasure to uh, pass the microphone to give the floor to our first speaker. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, John Murray, for the introduction um, and for hosting this uh, inaugural <coughs> lecture. Um, so I'm Devang Mehta, I'm a new professor in the Department of uh, Crop Biotechnology. Um, and I moved to, to Berlin from Canada, where I did my postdoctoral research. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the future plan for my new research group, um, trying to engineer plant biology, but more specifically engineer plant chronobiology, the circadian rhythms uh, that plants have. Um, and then I'll also describe some of my previous research or previous work, academic work, um, during my postdoctoral studies around uh, reimagining the culture of how we do research in the first place. Um, uh, just as a kind of uh, launching point for uh, sparking some new discussions uh, within the department, within uh, the community here in Haven. So, um, before I begin, um, it's uh, quite natural uh, for a plant scientist or for an agricultural researcher to begin with a, a curve of showing you how fast human population is growing around the planet, and the need that we have for, for growing uh, more crops. Um, I find it a, a lot more easier to imagine this when you put this down in something that's maybe a little bit more relatable, is exactly how many people we need to feed. Um, and this is a, a prediction 
by Megan Clark, who is a, a researcher at the CSIRO in Australia, who uh, basically said that over the next 50 years, we will need to produce as much food as has been produced throughout human history. So this is just a way of uh, really making clear the, the scale of the challenge that we face as all of us working in agriculture and uh, specifically also in plant sciences. Uh, and this is really the goal that motivates a lot of the research that, uh, that my lab is doing. Um, now this challenge, of course, uh, is a dual challenge. It's not just a challenge of rising population around the planet. Um, at the same time, we also have rising global temperatures. We have climate change um, that's accelerating. Um, and the threats that climate change poses to agriculture are um, really profound. They're, they're never before seen um, challenges. Um, the, some of these challenges or some of these threats are basically uh, an expansion in the range of many pathogens that affect plants. So many insects, many fungal pathogens, bacterial pathogens, they're expanding in range from different geographical areas where they were historically located to new geographical areas infecting plants that were never encountering these, uh, uh, these species of pathogens before in their, in their evolutionary history. Um, so this is a major challenge. The second challenge is, of course, at the same time, we also have abiotic stresses that are um, more prevalent now. Uh, the most important in many parts of the world is drought. You have an increasing frequency and increasing severity of drought around the world. But at the same time, other parts of the world have the opposite problem, where you have increased flooding, increased uh, coastal uh, uh, submersion of, of crops, uh, which also causes uh, a lot of damage. And then in other parts of the world, uh, very frequently we have um, uh, heat waves that are occurring at a greater frequency, including in, in Europe and Northern Europe. Um, and these heat waves, um, these, these, these cases of uh, heat waves, flooding, drought, pathogen expansion, uh, these are very specific threats. Um, there are different threats in different parts of the world. So you can imagine a different pathogen is affecting a different crop species or a different crop variety in a specific geographical location. Uh, you have a different degree and, and type of drought affecting plants, uh, particular species in different parts of the world. So these are what I like to call local symptoms of a global disease. So uh, what I mean by this is all of these are very important problems that we all tackle in our research, uh, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there is a global problem that um, these things are just a manifestation of at a local level. Um, and one of these, uh, when, you look, when you think about this from a global perspective, there are also uh, global level, um, levels of change that um, climate change is causing in, in agriculture. Uh, what my lab is interested in, uh, in particular, is how climate change is driving um, global um, uh, crop migration. So basically, the, the movement of crop species or where crops are being grown across the planet itself is, uh, is moving in response to climate change. And this is, I believe, a challenge that plant scientists, or at least molecular plant scientists, haven't really thought about or decided to work on uh, this. Um, this is very nicely illustrated in this uh, image, which is from a research paper from a few years ago. Um, and in this research paper, uh, climate scientists basically projected um, the movement or the, the migration of crops like soybean, wheat, but also other major crops um, over the last 40 years. Uh, so during a period of maybe a little bit slower climate change compared to what we see now, but still increasing temperatures. So you can see um, in the top uh, graph, you have soybean cultivation, and they monitored soybean cultivation over a period of 40 years, during which soybean um, crops around the planet uh, experience an average increase in temperature of 0 0.7 degrees Celsius. Uh, the same case for wheat in the bottom panel uh, of 1.1 degrees Celsius. Uh, and what you see on the close-up, the zoomed-in images, is the uh, migration of these crops um, in the case of wheat in the northern hemisphere moving northwards as uh, over this 40-year period as temperatures increase. In the case of soybean in Brazil, moving southwards uh, away from the equator. So the natural um, conclusion here is that crops uh, and the, the, the ability to grow crops at high production levels is um, moving these crop productive areas away from the equator. The equators are basically getting too hot for cultivation of many crops, um, and there is scope for maybe increasing yields or increasing productivity um, in northern latitudes and southern latitudes. Um, now, one challenge with this problem is that uh, many of these crops have not adapted, they've not evolved to, to deal with the different environments that are present in these uh, new latitudes, right? Um, they are used to increasing temperatures. This is what has actually driven this migration. 
uh, but they aren't used to other changes that come with latitude, things like seasons, um, which change uh, the, the duration and the, uh, the frequency of change uh, from day length across a single season, uh, is something that changes with latitude, and this is not something these crops have experienced before. Um, so this is one challenge that my lab is, is uh, decided to study. Um, and our approach, uh, just to quickly summarize it, is um, what I call experimental systems biology. Um, and this approach basically <coughs> follows uh, this kind of a cycle where we perform experiments. Um, so in my lab, we, or in my research, I usually look at experiments looking at both genetic as well as environmental changes. So performing, uh, for example, CRISPR screens where you knock out or you mutate particular genes using CRISPR-Cas9 technology, um, but also simulating uh, changes in natural environments within that control conditions so that you can combine the genetic as well as the environmental changes that these plants have undergone. Now these kinds of experiments lead us to ask new questions. Um, one of the questions I'm very particularly interested in is uh, how do post-genetic uh, regulatory uh, events uh, control these environmental changes that we see in our experimental setups? Uh, and by post-genetic regulation, I'm talking about everything that happens when you go from RNA or from uh, RNA expression to protein production. Now, uh, answering these questions requires a lot of uh, advanced technologies. It requires using as well as developing new technological methods. Um, in my case, I focus now a lot on method development. So my previous work has been looking at uh, developing new sequencing methodologies, but more recently looking at developing new methods of proteomics. So the tool by which we can monitor all protein levels in all cells at a, at a given time point, uh, and to do that at a really high throughput. Um, and then I'm also exploring uh, in vivo uh, interactomics as another methodology to really monitor what is happening between the RNA level and the protein levels uh, of plants that are experiencing climate change as well as genetic changes. Now, we obviously produce a lot of data um, from these experiments, uh, a lot of proteomics experiments, genomic experiments are producing uh, terabytes of data that need to be analyzed. The types of data that we are interested in are generally protein and mRNA abundance data, as well as protein-protein interaction data. Uh, now, analyzing this data is obviously a huge challenge. Um, my experience and expertise is not really uh, in developing new analytical tools. I rather use analytical tools that have been developed by collaborators, for example. Uh, and I think we will hear today from Jan about other methods of uh, visualizing and studying this kind of data. Um, but basically, we use uh, these multiple data types and use uh, multi-omics data analysis methods that have been developed by collaborators to process this data and really get new hypotheses from the experiments we perform in the first step. So these new hypotheses are generally linking new pathways, new biological pathways, and new processes to the uh, original environmental and genetic changes that we perform in our plants, in our experiments themselves. And the whole idea of getting these new uh, genetic targets and new processes is because this will now allow us to create plants with new phenotypes, phenotypes that might be more preferred for future agricultural scenarios. So, um, in the next few minutes, I'll quickly describe one such uh, experiment or one such uh, research project within the scheme. Um, and this is a, a project that's been started by my PhD student, uh, Aisha. Um, uh, with uh, FWO funding, and this is looking at creating plants with better adaptability across different latitudes. Uh, so in this project, Asha is working on trying to create new genetic variation within the model plant Raptopsis. Uh, we prefer to first start with model systems and then move into translating research into crop systems. Um, in this case, she's focusing on using CRISPR-Cas9 technology to edit the genes uh, lf one cc one which are two important circadian crop genes. Which is creating a whole pool of mutated plants that have different versions of these genes uh, because those uh, different genes will result in different phenotypes. Now, to screen for those phenotypes, we also need to do a lot of work uh, because we can't really go to all latitudes on the planet and plant around those plants. We have to do this in, within the lab scale. So, we do a lot of work now on building test chambers within which we can simulate very precisely simulated life at different latitudes. So, we can really predict. What is the light scenarios that are that plants would experience if they move from one latitude to another latitude? Uh, and these changes include changes in photo period, in the spectrum of the light itself, which changes, so how much red light, how much blue light is present at any given point, uh, time point, as well as changes in the length of twilight, which is the period of partial intensity light before peak uh, sunrise and, and darkness. 
And we do a lot, uh, we plan to do a lot of monitoring of the phenotypes using uh, basic parameters like flowering time, yield, biomass, but also using um, some computer vision software and, and methodologies to monitor the movement as well as the growth of these plants. And then the final step, of course, in this experiment is to understand a mechanism by which we see different phenotypes in the simulated lab conditions. And in order to do this, uh, we try to use these uh, technologies uh, as well as develop new technologies uh, around RNA sequencing, chip sequencing, uh, as well as proteomics, uh, mass spectrometry, uh, based proteomics, uh, in order to eventually get to a conserved mechanism by which particular variations in these genes would result in very specific, predictable phenotypes when plants cross from one latitude to another latitude. So uh, this project has uh, been going on for, for a little less than a year, and my time in K. Leuven has also been uh, just over a year. Uh, and I'm very lucky that I've been able to now start research uh, with master students as well as PhD students, uh, but also importantly with academic collaborators within the department as well as across K. Leuven. So I'm really um, glad that I've been able to now start collaborating with Bram, for example, uh, for looking at biology and horticulture. Uh, as well as a lot of work and a lot of joint funding applications uh, with a lot of people across the university in the procurement space. Uh, hopefully some of these will be successful, uh, we'll find out in the next year. Um, and then also a lot of informal collaborations, so my thanks to uh, a lot of our colleagues for uh, just approaching me with ideas or approaching me with samples for, for that analysis as well. Um, now in the last half of my talk, I'm going to switch gears uh, and talk about something completely different from uh, the science that I've been describing, uh, which is a lot of the work I've been doing over the last four years uh, around research culture. So this is a completely different topic, but I think it's also an important topic to consider as active researchers, as active professors in a publicly funded institution, uh, because uh, this really governs how our science progresses and who gets to do what science. Um, if you look at my publication history, uh, you can see that uh, yeah, a lot of uh, the publications, the academic publications that I've uh, had over the last few years have focused on this topic, and this is often commented upon, uh, luckily, positively, in the case of the Bob Sapp position, uh, which I received. So I thought I'd go into this a little bit more in detail, and then hopefully spark some interesting discussions uh, at the after all. So uh, the first question is, of course, uh, why do we need to imagine uh, or reimagine research culture in the first place? Um, uh, I don't think this needs uh, really a lot of explanation. Uh, I think all of us academics like complaining about our jobs all of the time. So uh, it's nothing new. We know that we need to always think of something new in terms of research culture. But there's some data behind this. So the Wellcome Trust, which is a charity in the UK that does a lot of science funding, uh, commissioned a major study in 2020 looking at research culture not only in the UK, but also across many different European countries. Uh, and what they found was quite striking. Uh, so this is just one of the results, which was a sentiment analysis looking at what are the words that people associate, people active in research, associate with research culture in general. Uh, and over here you see that only a third of researchers in this study actually uh, made uh, positive sentiments uh, or expressed positive sentiments about the culture of research in their institutions or in their research environments. Uh, this is obviously quite uh, worrisome because it means that two thirds of us are not completely satisfied with our research culture. Um, so then the, the Wellcome Trust also decided to do some research into what are the causes for this uh, uh, problem. Um, and one of the things they looked at was, for example, bullying and harassment, which was rated as one of the highest reasons for dissatisfaction with research culture. And then when you look at the causes of uh, bullying and harassment within research uh, environments, uh, it should not surprise anyone that gender is the highest um, category. Uh, and then there's another category, race and ethnicity, uh, age, nationality, uh, that are also extremely high in this list uh, of the proportion of people who both experience as well as witness harassment on these bases. So um, for me, for the rest of the talk, I will focus more on the racial and xenophobic discrimination because that's something I have more direct experience with. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that there are other aspects along which uh, people experience negative research culture um, as well. Uh, one thing that's also important to point out here is the gaps between uh, experience as well as witness. So, for example, if you look at discrimination or harassment based on race or ethnicity, you can see that only 14% of the um, of respondents said that they experienced this, but you can see a much higher percent, almost double, actually witnessed this. Uh, and that's, again, an interesting dynamic uh, to explore. Um, 
So for me, um, this uh, report came out at a time when I was already thinking and writing about this topic. Um, and I think it's particularly coming to Europe um, or returning to Europe, I should say, I think it's very important that we think and talk about racism within academic environments. Uh, and one of the main reasons is that uh, science, technology, engineering, and medicine as a sector within Europe is increasingly reliant upon immigrants from parts of the world or immigrants that come from what's known in the social sciences as racialized groups. Um, these are, for example, this is data from Germany. Um, and you can see a, a lot of the, the foreign students who come for uh, science and engineering courses uh, come from parts of the world um, um, that are considered um, representing uh, racialized groups within Europe. Um, now, these survey results were not really surprising to me because they tallied with my personal experiences as a PhD student, as a master's student in Europe as well. Um, so, for example, experiences with racism within the academy. Um, so, for example, witnessing harassment of racialized staff by local staff that had authority, uh, so authority figures within lab, lab environments. Uh, the standard experiences that I think any uh, foreign student in Europe would have experienced, which is short-term contract extensions, uh, visa issues, um, non-white students offered longer, ex uh, white students offered longer extensions, more words of rather European students, uh, offered longer extensions. These were things I witnessed personally in, in my labs uh, that I was working with. And then there's also this whole system of microaggressions that are present within research environments. Um, so I did have, for example, emails from professors threatening uh, foreign students with deportation for missing class, uh, something quite extreme. Um, uh, there's also the standard scenario that happens when you're presenting a poster as a foreign student where people come and praise your research and then ask, when are you going back to have your own country? Uh, kind of, uh, almost nationalist uh, expression of, uh, of what science is supposed to be. Uh, there were also experiences where, uh, there was also Islamophobic experiences where I was told that I needed to instruct Muslim students in the lab rather than the female lab technicians because they did not believe that Muslim female students would love, respond to female authority figures. Um, and then this all results in pretty stark differences in career success rates across uh, different lab environments. Uh, and this was quite visible uh, within my uh, research environment. Um, and now, all of these microaggressions uh, you know, are not really noted uh, or not considered a problem till they really explode to the surface. And then, uh, the year I left ETH Zurich as my, uh, as my PhD ended, uh, we had a massive problem at ETH where there was massive vandalism and, and these kind of uh, anti Asian attacks on student quarters, living quarters uh, in Zurich. Now, a lot of this racism within the academy can be tackled uh, and looked at and has been recognized by many universities, including Kai Levin. Uh, but often we forget that this is happening not only in isolation, we're not living within a university surrounded by walls, uh, we're living within a broader society. And there's also racism outside the university environment that impacts the quality and the life experiences and the research experiences of uh, minority students as well. So for example, you have racist and xenophobic politics. This was very common in Switzerland. These are some examples uh, from the news uh, at the time I was doing my PhD. Uh, then you also have micro microaggressions outside the university as well. Much more frequent actually outside the university. Issues with housing that were very common. I think uh, a, a lot of my former colleagues are here as well and we know this, this problem personally. Um, so th all of these experiences led me to think about at the time I was starting my postdoc, uh, you know, how can we solve these problems? What are the structures within the academy or within how academic science is organized that promote these problems and what, how, what can we do to, to address these? Um, some of these are very obvious. I think we've all talked about them at some point or the other. The fact that there's such vast power differentials between the staff and the uh, professional staff, the individual professors and the students and the, the postdoctoral and the temporary staff that we teach. Um, the fact that anonymous peer review in grant applications as well as journal uh, reviewing gives a safe space for bullies and discrimination. Uh, there's a lot of data behind this uh, that I won't go into today. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that I was very interested in at the end of my PhD was science publishing, also for other reasons that I won't go into today, but uh, I, I found science publishing as one of the major drivers for bias, um, and I'll explain why. Um, the first, the first reason, of course, is that science publishing is basically the currency of science, right? Our progress as researchers and scientists really relies on our journals and the, the, pub, the publication lists that we produce. Um, and one thing that's been noted is that 
uh, over multiple studies, we know that uh, minority researchers, women researchers, tend to get less funding. Uh, now, when you get less funding, you have less money to publish, you publish less. You publish less, and because you publish less, you get cited less, so you have less citations. Because you get less, less cited uh, less, you have a lower age impact, you tend to have a lower kind of aggregate impact factor based on the journals you publish in, and this tanks your reputation compared to other uh, colleagues. Now, this is a vicious cycle because, of course, when you go and apply for grant funding, people look at the age, uh, the age index and look at your publication list, and this starts a whole feed-forward uh, loop in, in engineering terms, um, which drives uh, a lot of uh, discrimination or, or uh, discriminatory outcomes in, in science. And of course, in this cycle, at any point, you can have a bias playing into this, driving this at the even higher level. So for example, you can have bias in who gets less funding or who gets more funding. We know that this exists based on published uh, surveys and literature. We know that uh, there can be bias in who gets to publish, and I will talk about this. Uh, and we also know that there's bias in who gets cited uh, by who. And then, um, of course, this results in bias in who has a higher age index versus who has a lower age. So what can we do about this as an early career researcher? So I was an early career researcher uh, when I uh, came to, to discover this problem. Uh, one of the first things I was able to do was in, I was invited to write a, an article by, by Nature for their first uh, front page editorial, uh, where I talked about um, my experiences as a PhD student and some of the solutions that I, I proposed within lab environments as well. Um, and then since then, when I moved to the University of Alberta in Canada, I joined the Faculty uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, uh, which then published this uh, peer-reviewed article. I always say peer-reviewed because sometimes these are not considered real publications uh, by scientists. Uh, but this is a peer-reviewed article looking at uh, some principles by which organizations, uh, PIs, but also departments and faculties can uh, address this, this uh, problem of bias and discrimination. Um, and this is not a, a problem that's not being recognized. Uh, so for example, this article was personally edited by um, a Nobel Prize winner, so this is something that's been recognized at the highest levels, um, at least in, in North America. And then I also give talks, for example, uh, in this lecture series at uh, TU Darmstadt in, in Germany. Um, but one thing I started to do was, uh, you know, more than just talking about this, we need to actually start creating change in the community. Uh, and one of the things I was lucky to get involved with was something called the uh, eLife Early Career Advisory Group. This is an advisory group that was set up by the journal ELIFE. Uh, ELIFE is a prominent life sciences journal. Uh, and what they had an idea was uh, recreate an advisory group comprised only of PhD students, postdocs, and early career faculty to advise the, the journal on all aspects of uh, editorial policy. Um, so uh, this was one of the first early career groups at any major journal. Uh, and we were able to really guide policy making at the highest level. So we had to direct lines to the editorial board, as well as the editor-in-chief, as well as the board of directors of the, the journal. Um, what was really important was this group was selected anonymously. So they did not have access to our publication list, our names, where we came from. What they did know was that the group would always be geographically and gender balanced. So it was always represented from every single continent, and it was always gender balanced. Um, and this has since inspired efforts at other journals as well. Um, and then one of the things that the ECAG, the Early Career Advisory Group, did was expand this group as well. So we expanded the impact that we were having by creating the ELIFE Ambassadors Program, where we have now trained over 500 different scientists from around the world that are also creating their own communities of change. Uh, so now, uh, one of the striking realizations to this program was that there, this is not a problem that uh, very few scientists are interested in solving. It's a problem that like, hundreds of scientists around the world are really interested in finding new ways of doing science. Um, so organizations of eLife um, are creating these groups just to amplify these voices, but these voices already exist. And it's important to mention this because often we feel that we're the only ones who are trying to do change, but it's important to recognize that this is something that all of us are invested in. Um, so one of the things that we were able to do at eLife was really create organizational change. And by this I mean that we were able to tell the journal what they needed to do to improve equity, uh, inclusion, and diversity within the journal uh, publishing. Uh, some of the, the recommendations we met, made was that the journal should report very publicly on a quarterly basis on the progress towards meeting commitments towards diversity. And this is something that the journal actually does um, now on. Um, one of the important things we realized was that the way journals in academia work 
is through friend networks, right? So if you're an editor in journal and you want a new editor, you call up your friends. Uh, and this leads to a lot of bias in who gets, gets to become an editor and who gets to decide which papers get published, which papers don't get published. Uh, and one of the things we suggested to Eli was, why don't we switch this, right? There is no guarantee that someone who's a professor, who's a good friend of yours, who's a good researcher, is also a good editor. These are two different skill sets. So why don't we recruit editors based on the skill sets that editing requires? So now we've started this process at Eli where we suggested them, why don't we recruit editors through open calls rather than these private networks? We also asked Eli to implement systems that report to editors what their record of recruiting uh, diverse review panels is. Because we found at Eli, and this is true at other journals as well, that when you have male editors, they tend to only look at male reviewers. When you have female editors, they look also at male reviewers. So this is a big problem within uh, editing as well. And then we also took the, uh, asked the journal to take measures to ensure that editors avoid homophily, which is this problem where editors are only recruiting uh, female uh, or all male panels uh, for reviewing papers. One of the important things about this uh, experience was that um, it was only successful because the journal actually gave us the authority and actually the uh, encouragement to actually make these measures uh, possible. So uh, we were really told by the editor in chief of the journal that our job was to hold their feet. Um, so for one example of this was that in 2019, we proposed uh, reforms to how the journal recruits new editors. In 2020, we again created a more formalized proposal for how to recruit new editors. In 2021, the journal decided to create a working group to look at how to develop this uh, proposal. And then luckily, finally, in 2022, uh, Eli, for the first time, had an open call for editors from Latin America and the Caribbean, so really specifically looking at which group of scientists were underrepresented in the editorial board trying to recruit those uh, scientists. And then in 2023, 43 of these uh, editors were recruited from Latin America. So one of the lessons, of course, is to remain persistent in these kinds of uh, uh, movements for change uh, within any academic structure. Uh, these are just the, the examples of the, the story. Now, one of the, uh, the things I wanted to end on is sometimes the thing that we need to do uh, the most or the hardest thing uh, that's uh, needed is to reimagine the whole system, right? Uh, and this is something that we did at Eli together with the leadership at Eli, which was how do we reimagine how science publishing works. So in typical science publishing, you submit your paper to a journal, an editor gets that paper, they decide should this paper go to review or not go to review. Uh, that's an initial first check. Then it goes to peer review where you invest a lot of time, a lot of our colleagues invest time reviewing papers, deciding are they good enough, uh, sometimes deciding on maybe more biased spaces, which papers get to get published or not. Uh, and then those papers get published. Uh, this is a hugely expensive process. And what we managed to, to work with Eli to, to get towards was a system where we uh, kind of avoid this entire process. What we do is we send the papers to Eli. Uh, Eli, if it has editors in that topic, will review the paper. And then the reviews are posted publicly along with the paper, irrespective of whether there's an accept or reject decision. So there's no exception or uh, there's no process of actually filtering papers by what reviewers think. Instead, you get to see what the reviews actually thought. The, the process is not opaque like it is in many other journals. Uh, so I want to end with uh, some kind of messages about you know, what I think we should all be able to do in order to kind of change the way we look at publishing and to try and address some of these biases. Uh, and the first thing that we can do is stop playing a rigged game. Uh, and by this, I mean that many of these journals that we respect, right, like Nature, Science, Cell, uh, these journals are purposefully creating artificial scarcity. So when you look at, for example, how many papers these journals have published since the internet came about, right? So the whole reason for having journals was there was no internet, you needed someone to publish articles in paper form. Uh, but if you imagine that now you have the internet, you can publish any number of articles you want in a journal, you would expect that these journals actually publish more papers now than they did in 1960, but the opposite is true these journals publish actually less papers now than they did in 1960. And this is the, how these journals are creating this artificial scarcity, which creates room for bias uh, within the publishing system. So in my own lab, I have a very clear policy on open science, uh, where I really have a uh, um, uh, pledge to only publish in open access non-profit journals to avoid this, this whole scheme of uh, for-profit publishing. Um, and this is something that's supported at the highest levels of policy making within Europe. So this is a statement from the European Commission, and there's a statement from the European Council as well, supporting such policies. 
And then I think it's also important to think about what institutions, especially now that I'm on the other side of the kind of management divide, uh, is what can we do to support ECRs who want to reform science. Uh, and this is something we came up with as a group of 40 uh, early career researchers around the world. We sat together and came up with recommendations that any institution can implement to try and institute such uh, reforms, or to create an environment that encourages reform. Uh, one of the first things was we need to incentivize activities to reform and improve science. We don't often do this. We look at only outputs in terms of publications, or out outputs in terms of teaching, but we don't really look at outputs in terms of improving the way we do science in the first place. Um, we need to integrate early career researchers, PhD students, postdocs in our decision making from uh, the ground. We need to give resources that can allow early career researchers to take their to take risks, to think of new ideas, and implement new ideas. We need to recognize and amplify, of course, the voices of early career researchers who are trying to do this work, and champion especially marginalized early career researchers, researchers who are coming from marginalized groups. And then finally, we need to support these global initiatives that are occurring around the planet. So I will quickly end, uh, because I realize my time is up, but I want to end with a kind of call to action. There are many ways in which early career researchers in the audience today can get involved in these efforts to improve science. Many journals have established these early career advisory boards or advisory groups. For example, you can see JBC over there, a major biochemistry journal. Um, you can also look at how uh, other funding institutions are changing. So for example, CIHR, which is the main um, Canadian Health Research Funder has now actually an early career researcher, a postdoctoral researcher, in its board of governors, so really the highest level of management of the funder. Um, and then we can also work within our own institutions, within our own institutes to, to reform science. So with that, I'd like to end by first acknowledging all of the people uh, because of whom I'm standing here today. Uh, the group at ETH Zurich, where I did my PhD, uh, led by Tadeo van der Schoen. We can see uh, acting like a Belgian over there. <laughs> Uh, this was, of course, thanks to funding from the European Union. Um, also, my thanks to the lab in Canada, as well as all of the many different collaborators I managed to work with in, in Canada, uh, especially Glenn and Ulrich, who was the head of the lab, a new PI um, at the time, uh, and also all of the group members for all of the fun times we had uh, in the lab and outside the lab. And then finally, I'll end by thanking my current division for giving me a very welcoming home for, first of all, supporting me through the box up process in the first place, Ram, Barbara, uh, Nico, Joel, and Harry, and then of course my group, uh, my new group as well. Um, and then with that, I'd like to end with, uh, with taking any questions. Thank you. Given the time, maybe one question. Uh, the rest during the reception, there is plenty of time. Is there an urgent, burning question? Yes. Just about Margaret, I used to work here, but now I just am a bit. But um, I was wondering whether plants adapt slower to climate change than insects or pests. It's a much shorter yeah, lifespan. It's a very good question. Uh, I think it depends on the plant. Uh, we know that. I don't. I don't think it's been studied very carefully in comparison of evolution. Yeah, or the responses of insects versus plants. But we know that different plants respond differently to different stresses. For example, plants like weeds respond very quickly to herbicides, for example. So I can imagine that there's a very broad spectrum in the range uh, of adaptation of plants. Uh, you can also think that plants would adapt more because um, they can't move uh, themselves, right? They, they, they can't really escape uh, climate change, so there's maybe a greater selection pressure uh, in there um, compared to insects, but I'm not a entomologist. Thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, in the next speaker is coming from the Human Health Institute.